Welcome to General Biology for Non-Majors. Um, this is the beginning of our first week and our first week is going to be mainly exploring the term biology and understanding uh, some of the key terminologies as to how we will um, start discussing the main concepts in this class. So let's look at biology which has two parts in its word. The first part which says bio means life and logi means study. So in real scenario biology does mean study of life. So just as the word tells you biology. Um, when we say life then what do we mean by life? How do we differentiate living organisms from non-living organisms. There are certain properties or attributes that are given to living uh, creatures or organism and we will explore that in a few minutes. Um, before we go on, keep in my in mind that biology is mainly based on nature and nature is organized in a very unique pattern. It has v various levels of organization. By various levels of organization we're talking about um, a small little bacteria which is not, uh, which is um, invisible to the naked eye as compared to a large tree or a large donkey or a monkey or small fungi or algae. So there are different levels of organization in us in this um, unique um, uh, discipline. And uh, there are various um, aspects of understanding biology. Uh, general biology for non-majors is basically designed in such a manner that uh, the semester long experience will give you uh, a sense of what uh, is present in the discipline and how the discipline is uh, explored. We will uh, begin our discussion with mainly starting with uh, the study of cells and then we will get into the organizations of cells. We will um, next look at the various um, reactions or the metabolic processes that goes around the cell. We will then look at the growth or the cell division. We will study a little bit of biotechnology. We will study environmental biology and ecology and conclude by the study of plants and animals. So the, the old um, thought that biology is only the study of plants and animals is not really true anymore because the discipline has grown in, and exploded in the last couple of decades. So uh, let's look at uh, certain properties of life. Uh, the first property of life is organization. And this is so complex that I will skip for the for a minute as we will go on to the next slide on this uh, on exploring this organization. Um, metabolism is is the sum total of all reactions that are carried out by a living organism. Uh, metabolism will also include reactions which will help you digest food, um, energy that is provided for movement, uh, for walking or for swimming or for hiking, uh, how plants store energy, how they grow in size, how they respond to certain stimulus. So that's all going to be a lot of chemical reactions that we will study within metabolism. Growth is the next um, property of life. If we see a rock versus a plant, we will associate life with a plant and not the rock. Why? Because the rock never really increases in number uh, or in size. Uh, it can gr get crushed, but that's no, not really increasing the mass. Uh, the plant, however, can grow and increase in, in, um, in cell uh, quantity and also in, in the size of the cell. Now, most uh, when, we, when we say the increase in size of the cell, I want to point out over here, there is a term called unicellular, which means that uh, an organism is only composed of one cell. Now theoretically this one cell is not going to go humongous that it will be as large as even this mouse over here. Um, unicellular organisms will then 
form connections with more cells and form what are called as the multi multicellular organisms. And a multicellular organisms have thus increased the number of the cells. Uh, yes, certain bacteria will grow from a tiny cell to a little higher dimension, but the increase in size is relatively uh, definitive. However, uh, most living organisms will definitely grow in number, and the increase in number is going to be associated with certain kind of cell divisions that we will explore within the semester. The, the next concept is adaptability. Um, living organisms definitely had, have to adapt to the environment. Um, and this pretty much leads us to the next concept of evolution. By this we mean that if certain um, birds are present in a certain region where there are more um, uh, stocky fruits to eat with, then birds with the beak will not survive there better. So they will have to fit better with the environment. And the process of this is done through evolution and natural selection. However, um, the adaptability can also be related to uh, certain changes in pH, certain changes in temperature, uh, altitude, and so forth. Irritability is um, that living organisms can uh, definitely respond to any kind of external stimulus. So pretty much even if you take a pin and poke yourself in your hand, your reflex would be the hand would, uh, would shrink back. Uh, dogs and cats have a reflex where as you can see the tails of the cat um, start rising and uh, many animals have very strong uh, responses to external stimuli. Some certain organisms are very uh, responsive to um, to even a change in the climate, whether they will be able to relate to it. So these are certain properties of living organisms and non-living will definitely be missing those. Now let's look at the first uh, terminology which I had skipped in the previous slide, which is the organization. Uh, let's look at how uh, organized the living creatures are. Um, the basic structure or the basic fundamental block of many living um, creatures are a cell. But the cell is also organized from molecules and molecules are made up of atoms. So let's go back and see how this organization is coming up. Atoms would be something like carbon, uh, I can write an uh, atom of hydrogen, oxygen. These are elements that are present in, in the environment, in the living, in, the, in our world that will then be organized to form molecules. So for example, if I leave the hydrogen and oxygen together, uh, the molecules that can form could be H2O, um, even the hydrogen gas, or I can have oxygen as O2, which is the molecular form of oxygen. So in, 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 in these examples, uh, oxygen hydrogen and water, these are all molecules because molecules are made up of more than one atoms. Now certain molecules that we will learn in the, in the coming chapters can be um, can be formed even to form even chains of molecules or larger mo molecules and those are called as macromolecules. Now ma macromolecules then align to form uh, the region that is present uh, of the, of, I mean the region within the cell. Uh, a cell is a basic structure of living organism. Uh, cells of similar kind will form tissues, uh, will form tissues. Tissues, for example, if you have um, uh, connective tissue, then cells of your muscles will, um, of the same kind will uh, will organize and collect in one region and form tissues. Different kinds of tissues, for example, cardiac tissue, connective tissue, uh, bone tissue will then form different regions which are called as the organs. Organs are then uh, put together in a more structured format to form organ systems. For example, digestive system is not just made up of your stomach, it's going to be made up of intestines, uh, your mouth region, uh, uh, your esophagus and so forth. So organ systems then get organized to form organisms and organisms uh, are definitely going to be made up of one or more cells. Now this is a sort of like a, a flow chart of how different levels of organization exist from a simple atom 
to the largest biosphere the earth that we call is biosphere one and uh, because it's got a whole collection of not just uh, plants and animals and microbes and environment so this is sort of like a biosphere one uh, biosphere two for those of you who are living in arizona you know that there's a biosphere two in um, tucson um, arizona but um, we will get into ecology later l later to for you to understand this uh, different terminologies now um, different um, biospheres then can be grouped together to form different populations now a population for example can be a group of collective individuals that are present in one specific areas for example if we are looking at uh, in the in the in the marine uh, ocean then there's going to be a, a population of uh, various single celled or multi-celled organisms um, that are very specific in that region of the of the ocean and this particular example is from the fish species in the Red Sea. Now within that Red Sea not just the fish are present along with that we have the coral reefs we have uh, other kinds of algae and this will then form a community of uh, different populations that are present in a specific area. Now um, the Red Sea would then be associated with not just what's present within that community but also what are the outputs of energy and material around it. So pretty much how does it get flourished? Um, what um, uh, where is it present geographically and you may um, look in the picture in the book and you can see that it's present in in the Middle East um, around the Red Sea and then eventually all regions of the earth will hold together to form the biosphere. So we have uh, all these levels of organizations from atoms to the largest which is the biosphere. Uh, what does all these organisms require? The, there are two, rec the, they're actually the most important requirement for all organism is energy. And, and because energy is not just required for, the, for a cell to grow, but also to uh, organize different kinds of reactions, different activities within the cell. Um, where does this energy come from? The energy is really coming from the nutrients um, that the organism is depending on. So whether it's uh, consuming it directly or whether it's taking it from the environment, um, certain nutrients are required for the growth and survival. Now there are two kinds of um, of organisms, those that can produce their own food and those that depend on the other. For example, the first one are the producers. Uh, when we say the producers, then these are going to be your plants or certain bacteria will also be considered as, as uh, producers because they can manufacture their own uh, f uh, food. They, they take the input from the sun, uh, they take carbon dioxide or some of them can take methane and they can survive and they can make their own raw materials. Consumers are, are on the other hand uh, usually animals because the consumers will depend on the producers to then form uh, or then gain the energy. So this is a, a matter of uh, continuous flow of energy. Okay, so organisms uh, definitely respond to change. Um, there are various receptors present um, that will stimulate um, cells within uh, a certain region and um, simulation can be taken into account even for something um, like a bacterial cell has certain uh, receptors on the on its cell membrane and cell walls and it can respond to stimulus um, for certain um, bacteria they have for example if I draw a bacterial cell over here um, let's say this is a, a pneumonia bacteria it actually has a thick coating outside which is called as the as the cell cap or the wall and it prevents the bacteria from um, write down the name of this bacteria that it will uh, it will it will help the bacteria to survive because it will help it not to respond to certain stimulation on the outside and this could be even a such as a, a drastic effect of the pH either very high or very low now certain um, cells if have if cells are continuously, let's put it this way, responding to certain stimulus, then um, it will be very hard for the organ for a cell to survive. Now, 
it, within our internal chemistry, we do have a mechanism which is called as homeostasis, which means that we respond to certain conditions through a range. So uh, homeostasis would um, would be how to respond to a stimulus so that it does not drastically destroy the cell. And we will also explore these in the subsequent chapters. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, pretty much you have seen so far that I have been focusing on organization of the living cell and it's a must. Um, organization is um, basically present in the genetic code. The genetic code is present in what is called as the DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. This is the genetic code. This is the code of life and this has all the information on what an organism should be, what kind of reactions the organism is going to undergo, what is the, the organism's out side appearance and what kind of uh, even diseases that they carry will be will be stored in their DNA and of course you um, you can pretty much um, see that the DNA is inherited from the parents to offspring so it's inherited uh, code of life that is coming from the parents um, um, development is another term development means that how a cell arises to an adult. For example, I can give you a good example on this one. For example, if you have eggs of um, of uh, of a creature and this creature eventually turns into a butterfly, you can see that it has gone through various stages of development. It first formed the larva. From the larva, we had uh, a stage that is called as a pupa stage and then into a butterfly. So a development is a series of processes or stages that the cell undergoes to to adult to form an adult uh, organism. So, uh, looking at all this unity among, uh, looking at all this organization among the species, uh, then gives us a, a whole new dimension of how to understand these or group these organisms together. And these are gr grouped through a system that is called as a classification system. A classification system is pretty much organizing species in very exclusive groups. And uh, there are, the latest concept is about the domain and I will get into it in a little while. Uh, in a little while. Uh, each organism is considered to have a species name. Uh, a species name has two parts. It's got the first part and, and the second part. The first part is usually the genus name and then you have the species name. For example, um, the, we humans are called as the Homo sapiens where Homo would be the genus name and sapiens would be the species name. Um, a tomato plant is called as Lycopersicum Esculentum. Uh, lentum. Let's get the right spelling done. A really long name instead of calling it a tomato. Again, it has two parts. The first part is the genus name and the second part is a species name. Um, I just used the word previously domain. All these organisms are grouped into three major domains. Uh, the, the first domain is called as the bacterial domain. Um, and they usually consist of all single cell and these single cell are all prokaryotes and we'll spend a good amount of time as to what prokaryotes are. Just to give you um, an example right now, a prokaryote is going to be a cell that has no true structures inside. So uh, a eukaryote, for example, cells of these are called as the eukaryotes and they have a nucleus inside, they have a mitochondria, a plant cell may even have a chloroplast, so all these membrane bound structures that are present inside are eukaryotes. A uh, prokaryote would be a cell that does not have membrane bound structures. So um, bacteria and the archaea are the two domains um, that are still being studied especially for division within the within the kingdom division within the within these two domains and we'll spend a good amount of time at the end of the semester going through all of these. Um, archaea are the most primitive uh, creatures. Uh, these are present in for example in sulfur springs in um, very deep uh, earth, oh, very deep oceans, hot springs and these are the most primitive 
kind of organisms. Archaeas are the prokaryotes and these will be the bacterial kingdom. And the last domain is uh, called as the eukaryote. Oops, sorry, this should not have been arising. I needed a pen over here. The eukaryotes and the eukaryotes are the ones that have lots of structures within the cell. So if you can think of a cell as a as a house, a prokaryote would have one large house with no differentiation between a kitchen and a bedroom or a living room. On the eukaryotes will be organization of different compartmentization within the cell. And that's what a eukaryote is. A eukaryotes are divided into different kingdoms and uh, the, some of them I've named over here. Protist are the simplest uh, ones. For example, an image of this is over here a euglena or a chlamydomonas one of uh, actually this looks like a euglena yeah or a paramecium plants would be something that are green fungi would be your uh, mushrooms and plants would be your kingdom that you i think uh, you already know an animal kingdom would be the ones that will have all the animals whether they're birds and reptiles and mammals and so forth so remember there are three main domains the first two bacteria and the archaea the kingdoms are not yet um, studied so we don't know all the kingdoms within that they are still divide, uh, researching to put them into different kingdoms Um, now we will explore a, a different part of uh, this week's lecture and that is about critical thinking and science. Um, earlier you've understood what biology is and you've you understood that, that we ended up with a discussion on domains. Now how all this um, thought process is carried on. Uh, science is a way of uh, gathering data, making observations, um, performing experiments, coming up with certain hypotheses. So. Uh, the study of science is based on critical thinking. Um, critical thinking is not just gathering information, is what you have learned and how what you have learned can be applied to a certain scenario. And I will try to help you uh, develop the critical thinking this, during this class. So we, during your quiz that you will be taking or your test, you will often find certain questions will not be direct questions. You have, you have the information and now is the time to apply what you have understood. So critical thinking is a very important aspect of science. Science is uh, based on judgment. So you always have to have um, a data to be analyzed. Researchers um, do that by, by certain steps that we call as a scientific uh, method. Uh, scientific method and then and your first um, lab that you will be doing is based on the scientific method, the SALSA lab. Um, we have uh, something what is called as observation. Observation is observing something in nature, a phenomena, and uh, after you have observed, you pretty much collect what is called as data. So after the observation, you collect data. From the data, you will make certain um, sensible guesses and these sensible guesses are called as hypotheses. Now this, remember it's still a, it's a guess, it's an assumption. So these have to be tested and the testation of this would come through now experiments. So hypotheses have to be experimentally tested. So once an experiment is successful then you can call it a theory or a law as um, as uh, the results show up but it's, sometimes experiments do not uh, come out to be successful and if that happens you have to go back and you change your hypotheses one of the good examples that I often give my classes are when you go to a doctor and you have some kind of illness you the nurse pretty much takes your observation your vitals and your blood pressure temperature and so forth um, the doctor comes in he gathers all the observations that has been collected will ask you more question and then test and then come up with a hypothesis which is a, a guess of what he assumes you may be suffering from and he will test that by giving you some kind of medication uh, sometimes most of the time the test will work and you will be feeling better but if you're not feeling well and you have to go back 
then it's almost changing the hypotheses or in some cases um, the nurse may call you next day and say <clears throat> excuse me the doctor would like to change the medication that he put you on or she put you on so that's a way of um, scientific method uh, whenever we do experiments uh, we always ha uh, have certain variables a variable is uh, for example something that needs to be measured and it's changing now if you are having more than one variables in an experiment uh, it's very difficult to find the effect of uh, let's say effect of temperature on the growth of bacteria for example if I keep the effect of temperature the effect of pH and the effect of uh, of a solution and try to see the growth of a bacteria it would be very hard to judge whether the temperature really affected this way or was it the pH so you always have to have measurable one or two you cannot have too many variables it will be very hard to do, to experiment with um, along with the variables you must always have a control group a control group is pretty much something that will not change so again when you do your ex when you do your exercise with the salsa lab pay attention to what your variable is in there and what's your control group in there Bi biological systems have many variables as you can see because we, there are so many things that can affect the growth of an organism experiment will usually focus on one variable at a time uh, a lot of these re of the experiments will lead into results and eventually results will lead into um, some scientific uh, theory uh, a scientific theory will then be eventually um, proved over time for example the, my favorite is the theory of gravitational um, objects will always fall depending on for how close they are from the surface of the earth that's a theory it almost is a law because it's always going to be correct theory of evolution states that the changes can occur like over the lines of descent so it's not something you will see right away so there are lots of theories that that are pretty much proven scientific experiments so this concludes our first week's lecture um, hopefully you have uh, you got familiar with Camtasia and my recording and this way we will be uh, listening to lectures every week and uh, don't forget to attempt your quiz for this week